Mario Vinasco. There he is. Very nice, very nice. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in this beautiful city. It's my first time in the Baltics. Uh, great invitation. Thank you very much for the organizers. I am here to tell you some case studies on how we use machine learning and artificial intelligence in our marketing efforts and our marketing programs. We have work hard to demystify that a little bit so marketers and people can use it in practical projects. And that's what I hope to share with you today. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to what machine learning is, how we use it, and some insights that help us tell us the story about this very powerful technology that we have been using in these projects. I'll give you also some ideas uh, about the platforms that we use, the systems that we have that are open source, free to use for everybody, and then move into the case studies themselves. Perhaps the most well-known or the most recognizable use of artificial intelligence is vision classification or uh, image recognition. By this time, this is completely trivial. Anybody knows that this is possible, but five or six years ago, it was extremely difficult or very expensive or nearly impossible for a computer to be able to tell who is a cat or what is a cat and what is a dog. Six years ago, five years ago, it was virtually impossible to do that for a computer. Because computers would not have the computing capacity, we didn't have the algorithms nor the breakthroughs that we have now to be able to classify that. One of the first things that happened is how do you represent an image in such a way that a computer can understand? A computer cannot see colors, cannot see textures. A computer only sees numbers. One of the earlier, earlier discoveries or early breakthroughs was to split the image in pixels. You have vertical pixels on vertical, let's say 200 by 200. That's 40,000 pixels per image. And represent each pixel by the three colors, red, blue, and green. That way, you no, you, longer no you no longer have an image. You have 120,000 data points that you will feed to a computer for classification purposes. That was the main breakthrough in order to do that. And obviously, the perceptron. The perceptron is a very simple mathematical operation. It's extremely simple. It's deceiving to think that a very simple sum product and a mathematical transformation would be able to classify things at the level that computers now can tell if it's a dog or if it's a cat. Very, very extremely deceiving and extremely simple. In this case, the x's, the x1, x2, and x3, will be the 120,000 data points that you will feed into the network or into the perceptron in that case. And the computer will guess the number w1, w2, w3, so on and so forth. Pure guess. That's what it really is. The computer will iteratively do that computation over and over and over, over thousands of images, over thousands of weights. Obviously, a simple perceptron will not do the trick. But when you stack many perceptrons, and when you have many layers of perceptrons, somewhere in here, somewhere in this network, is where the magic of artificial intelligence happens that is able to classify those photos. Again, five, six, perhaps seven years ago, I myself would not have believed that simple mathematical operations like this, repeated over and over and over again, would be able to tell these things apart. That is the core of artificial intelligence. That is the core of machine learning. It's not a mythical black box, but a very simple mathematical procedures of guessing and calibrating these number Ws. Obviously, the computer can do random guesses. It might take forever to do that. And there are other, other breakthroughs about how to do that in a smart way. And they use the updates of the iteratively of the updates using things called gradient descent, which uses the, the derivatives of the cost curve to do that. And that's why we can now train networks that are very fast, very accurate, and very powerful using these very simple concepts. For those that are curious to know about more machine learning, there are a number of papers, tutorials about how gradient descent works. It's a very, very smart algorithm to update those, num those weights until it gets to the classification accuracy that we need. Obviously, at Uber, we are not concerned, or we are not doing at the marketing group, we are not doing image classification. But we are doing customer retention. We are doing customer cross-sell. We are doing customer re-engagement. We, we do those things. And for that, we apply the same principles that as I just mentioned. But instead of classifying cats and dogs, what I'm now classifying is drivers that are going to churn 
that are going to stop driving for Uber from customers, from drivers that are not. And that is the power of machine learning in marketing. In the same way that I feed those 120,000 data points, in this case, if I take the entire population of drivers, I am not going to feed pixels. But imagine that I'm going to feed history. How many hours the person has driven with Uber? How much money have they collected? How many hours? The distance? How many incidents? How many emails the person has opened? So on and so on and so forth. And I collect a lot of variables, a lot of information about the behavior of these drivers. I look at the past, let's say at the past year. Obviously, I will know who of these people have and have not churned. That I know for sure because it's, I'm looking at the past. I feed that information into the same neural network or a classification tree for that matter, the same one that I use for the cats and dogs, and then the model comes with a probability that this person or this person is going to churn. The same way that the neural network produces a probability that the image is a cat or an image is a dog, the same probability is that this driver is going to churn, is going to stop driving for Uber. Then the magic of the, of the machine learning algorithm and the usability is, imagine then that I, I have the model, I train my network, my network is able to produce probabilities of people, then I take my entire driver population of Uber, I run it through the network, I score, each one of the drivers will get a probability, and I sort them from high to low in a list. Imagine a bucket or a list, like an Excel list, and I wait, let's say I wait a month and see what happens in that month, or two months for that matter, doesn't matter the number, of the, the time. And I make a cut, meaning that this is sorted, I make a cut at the 80th percentile. Are, we, are you with me? And then I wait and see what happens. If the model is good, if we train the model properly, if we have the right variables and the right uh, algorithms and the right data, we will see that the people, once I make the cut, the people in the top will have much more concentration of the true shorteners, of the people that actually stop driving for over than the people at the bottom, right? Obviously, we will have some true positives, but the model is not perfect. The model will miss people, right? The model, this is false positives, and these are false negatives. No model is perfect. No model in marketing is perfect. I, even the accuracy, the total accuracy of this model is, is quite low. But let me give you an example about the power of this. Imagine for a second that the churn rate is 10%, right? If you are a marketer and then you are going to design a promo, a campaign, or a treatment to prevent churn, to re-engage these people, let's say that you have a Facebook campaign, that means that for every 100 people that you target, you catch 10 of the people that you care about, right? 10% churn, simple as that. You do a random sampling, you do a random target, then for every 100 impressions, you catch 10. Now, you run the model. You run this machine model, the model gives you this ranking of people, and now you only target the top 20%. I'm going to target only the 20% of my customer base according to the model, and I catch five of the churners. Isn't that a much better marketing investment? Targeting 100 to catch 10 or target 20 to catch 5? It's a far more efficient vehicle, a much more a smart way of doing things. We are improving the effectiveness of our campaigns by 5x just by running the machine learning model. And again, what we are doing here is not using anything magical. We are using machine learning as a very powerful classification tool. Again, I can rank them. I know who these people are. I am not a marketer. I don't know what message is going to work. I don't know what promotion is going to work. But I can tell you, Mr. Marketer or Mrs. Marketer, I can tell you who these people are. And I can help you targeting them on social, email, you name it. So that's the power of the machine learning algorithms. That's why we invest a lot of effort, time, and money on these models. We have models for churn, we have models for open uh, emails, for unsubscription, for cross-sell, and many others. As, uh, as, they, as the introduction said, Uber is a giant artificial intelligence machine learning engine that we are trying to predict 
a lot of these things. And again, the beauty of that and the power of that is because it's a powerful segmentation tool that can isolate these people. Obviously, we train the models until we get that, um, that accuracy and that recall. Specifically, you measure the quality of um, machine learning models by these three key metrics. But I would argue that for marketing, perhaps the most important one is recall. Recall is, once I make the cut, this cut, how many of the people of interest do I catch? Right? If you are doing computer vision, image recognition, uh, automated cars, you might be more concerned with the total accuracy. Right? You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to misclassify things. But in marketing, we are, very, uh, we are concerned about how many of the people that we really want to target we catch once we make the cut. So, if anything, remember, machine learning is a very powerful classification tool, classification and segmentation tool, and perhaps recall is the best measure of quality of the models in marketing. Some of the platforms that we use, um, um, excuse me, some of the uh, recent ad advancements, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence continues to be uh, a very active area of research and investigation continues to evolve. Some of these things are the latest trends and the latest areas of research into that. I will invite you to learn more, do see tutorials, see other things, because it's really, really cool what is happening with embeddings, with reinforced learning, and many other things that they are doing that have achieved these unprecedented levels of accuracy, unprecedented level of almost magic that artificial intelligence is doing. But remember, it's all the core functionality that I explained to you is the same thing that they are doing at unprecedented scales, at unprecedented number of parameters, but that's what they are doing. Some of the tools that we use um, are open source. Um, all the big tech companies, mostly, most of them, Google, Facebook, you name it, have open source technologies. Ours is called Michelangelo, open source technology. It's a tool that allows us to train, to deploy, to manage the data, to manage the entire life cycle. Doing machine learning is very tricky. You have a bunch of data. You have to query the data. You have to put it in formats that the models can understand it. You have to score. You have to make and deploy those models into production. These tools, like Michelangelo, help to do that. It's open source, meaning that it's free. So the excuse for companies, because many people think that artificial intelligence and, or machine learning is only for the big tech, is not true. These tools are free to use. Hardware is not an issue. You can buy, rent a cloud computer, uh, elastic computing in Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Web, you name it. Hardware and software are no longer the problem. You have the data, you have the domain expertise, you can train the models. Machine learning is within reach of all companies, if not most. I would say, again, highly recommend this tool. Uh, Facebook has its own, Google has its own. There are many other uh, open source tools to do that. Let's move now to a, a real case where we, we, we use um, machine learning specifically to help with the communication with our customers. As far as I know, or as far as we knew at the time, no machine learning algorithm will tell us what is the right number of emails that we should send to our customers. How many emails should I send to my drivers or riders? I don't know. We, we didn't know. Nobody knew. But it was something that was bothering the executives of the company because we were seeing some unsubscription rates that were high, um, some complaints and some anecdotes about too much, too little, who knows. So the question to the data science team in marketing is, what should the right frequency, the right number of emails be for our users, for our riders, for our drivers, for our eaters, for our careers? We are scientists. We run machine learning models. We necessarily don't know those kind of things, but we were thinking, we have models, right? That's what we do. We build a bunch of models. We have models for churn, we have models for open rate prediction, and for unsubscription prediction, right? And if those models are any good, you will see a shape like the one that you have on the screen. You will have a shape like this. One common practice is you split your entire customer base in deciles. Decile is a group of 
equal sizes, 10%, 10%, 10%, you sort and rank them according to the model. And again, if the model is any good, what you will see here, this is a prediction for open rate, meaning this is a prediction that a person will open the next email that I sent based on the history and based on the same training that I did for the churners or that I did for the cats and dogs. You will see that for the top decile, the top decile, the open rate is almost 80%. And for the bottom decile, it's almost like 3 to 3%. Meaning that the model is able to discriminate and the model is able to separate that very well. Remember, machine learning is a powerful segmentation tool, classification tool. It's not perfect. We are not saying that every, when we predict it is going to be 100%. It's not perfect, but it's very, very accurate and very, very useful. So we have the model of open rate. We also have the model for unsubscription rate, where you have the same, the top, the top 10 decile has an extremely high unsubscription rate, and the bottom one has extremely low. Very, very, very different. That's the power of the models. The first idea that we have is, why don't we cross those two models? Right? Those are segments. You can think about 10 segments for open rate and 10 segments for unsubscription. Then you will get a 10 by 10, 100 matrix. Right? Segmentation. Segmentation 101. No mystery here. But it will be kind of hard to um, work and interpret and explain a matrix that is that big and that, and that large. So what we did was something very simple. High, medium, and low. High, medium, and low. What is high, what is medium, what is low? Well, we didn't know. We tried, we iterated, we tried several things. So in this case, we took the top two deciles of the open model, and then we took the, one, the top one decile of the unsubscription. And then now we have a three by three, a nine cell matrix that is very easy to interpret. And two things emerge almost immediately. Almost immediately. Notice the cells in red and notice the cells in green. What do you see on the cells in red? The cells in red very simply has very high probability of unsubscription, right? It's very high. And low to medium probability of open the email. Intuitively, what do you do with those guys? High probability to unsubscribe, low probability to open. Let's decrease the frequency to that segment, right? Again, I don't know the frequency. I don't know how many, but I know who they are. I can identify them. And then we can try, we can test, we can do A-B tests. We can monitor that over time because we know who they are, because we are running these models. The other pattern that emerged almost immediately was the, the cells in green. Again, very high probability of opening the email, very high, and medium to low probability to unsubscribe. These people could probably benefit for more emails, right? They have the appetite for it. They are not going to unsubscribe according to our models. How many more? Again, we don't know. I'm not a marketer. What kind of content? I don't know. But I can tell them who they are because we make these tools available for marketers to segment and to cross and make it easy for them to do it in Excel if they want to. And that's the power of these models. We make these models available as a segmentation tool to them and they can do these things. We explain how the models work so they know intuitively what they are doing and then we just let them do what they are good at. Experiment with these things, experiment with the communication frequency. We estimate that by prioritizing, by reducing the frequency here and augmenting it here, we might have saved 500,000 emails per year from unsubscription, which is a big, big deal, meaning that we have 500,000 customers more every year to communicate marketing messages to them. You did not lose them. So it's a big effort for a big, you know, for a big impact for the company. And again, that's why we invest so much money and effort and we hire people to train these models, to do creative things with this model, to do the creative part of, of, of machine learning. And I personally invest a lot of time trying to tell this story to the marketers. The same story that I'm telling here is the story that I tell them so they intuitively know how to use these models. Another case where we have used um, machine learning, and this is um, cross-sell. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with Uber Eats. It's the, it's the, uh, the food business. It's in the, in the United States. It's growing very fast in other parts of the world. 
where you, the same app that you have, for, very similar app, you order food instead of ordering a taxi cab, right? It's growing very, very fast. And obviously the people that are converting to Uber Eats come from Uber rides, meaning if I am riding a car for Uber, it's very likely that I will order food uh, with Uber Eats. So this is the conversion probability according to a, a cross-sell model. Again, same machine learning model. Is this person going to order food given that he is an Uber rider? Yes or no? The probability, same thing as the cats and dogs, same things at the churn. And one thing to notice is this is the actual conversion rate, by this, again, by decile, deciles of 10%, versus the prediction. This is my prediction, and this is the actual. You will see that when the model predicts low, converti low conversion, it's actually very low. It's actually very low. And when the model predicts a high probability of conversion, the actual conversion rate is high. Again, it's not 100%. This is not 100% accuracy. The conversion rate is 12, between 12 to 14% when it's predicted high. But notice that this group of people convert 15 times at the rate of these people. That's what the model is telling us. It's only a 12, 14% conversion rate, but these guys are converting 15 times higher. What do we do with them if you are a marketer? Again, I am not. I cannot tell you what promo, what incentive, what email to send them, but I can tell you who these people are. More importantly, I can tell you this. Perhaps these people over here, these people are not going to convert, no matter what we do. You, you have to throw $1,000 of food to them to, for them to convert. Why waste your money? Why waste your efforts, right? And maybe these people over here, they are already converting very well. Why do you have to give them incentives? Why do you have to spend money on them? Right? Perhaps the most important question then is the people over here in this area, these are the people that might benefit from a little push, right? From a little promo, a little incentive, a little email. Again, I don't know what email, what promotion, or how much, but I can tell you who they are. And you, Mr. Mar Mr. or Mrs. Marketer, can do the targeting, can do the campaigns. Again, this is another use case where machine learning has helped us to do those things, accelerate conversions, and make marketing more efficient. I have another use case, but I don't think I have the time to do that. I'm going to mention it very briefly. It's another application of machine learning. Um, we are using machine learning for um, time series forecast. We spend a lot of money, literally hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing around the world to attract and retain customers, social, search, TV, radio, and Machine learning is helping us to interpret the time series and convert those time series into efficiency curves. Once you have the efficiency curves, then you know where to, at what point to invest optimally in those channels around the world. And that's what we do. We convert those curves into efficiencies, we run optimization algorithms, and we do that. Again, this is, this is what we feed into the system, this is what we get, and this is a prototype of the models. With that, I will leave you with the, uh, with the questions, with hopefully with the motivation, hopefully with the insights that now you understand machine learning better, that you have seen how machine learning works in the real world, and how we have used it in practical cases and the important gains that we have obtained by using those models at Uber. I will open it to questions then. Thank you.